All right, guys, let's get to the sermon. Uh, Romans chapter 13, Romans 13, if you haven't turned away from there. Romans 13, I just want to grab one key thought there. One key thought from verse number one. Let's just have a look at this. It says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Okay, so notice that uh, Romans 13, if you read it in context, it's about government. It's about human government. And a lot of people in general, because a lot of people don't like governments, just as a general rule of thumb, most people don't like governments, okay? And it's, it's not that government in of itself is an evil thing. It's just that there are so many people in government that are wicked and evil, and they bring in ungodly laws, laws that are anti-biblical. And that's why, generally speaking, even amongst Christians, people don't like government, okay? And even, I mean, I'm even talking about the, the non-believing world. Just in general, because they know how hypocritical uh, government usually is. I mean, even here in Australia, we're seeing prime ministers getting backstabbed. You know, it, it seems like every couple of years, there's another prime minister getting backstabbed by someone in their, in their, in their party, and then someone else usurping authority as prime minister. And so, it's just the nature of things, that we live in a world where people have a sinful nature. And so, no matter what institutions we read about, no matter what powers we read about, there's always going to be some faults, because we're, we're fallen human beings. But the thing that I want you to notice is that powers are ordained of God. No, government is a power, it's an institution that's ordained by God. This is a sermon that I preached not too long ago, just a few months ago in my church there in uh, Caloundra. Uh, but I believe it's a very important topic, a very important topic. It's not just about government today. We're going to be looking at four different institutions that God has ordained in our lives. Four different institutions and all four institutions have a power. Okay, there's there's uh, someone uh, as, as, as the head, and there are people that are subject unto that power. Okay? And today, this is a sermon that needs to be preached. Because today we, we live in a society, we live in a generation of people that don't want to take blame for their mistakes. They don't want to take responsibility for their actions. That's number one. Number two, we live in a generation that has no uh, respect for authority. Okay, there's just no respect for authority, no respect for people that are above them, you know. And I used to think it was a generational problem, you know, I, I, would, I would look at people that would come from what they call uh, the millennial generation and talk about how, you know, they feel that they're, they're deserving all, all kinds of, um, you know, like the world owes them things and, and they don't need to give anything back to the world. But one thing that I learned about, you know, just humanity is that the reason why we have a bad generation is because the previous generation raised them that way. Okay? And sometimes we blame the new generation, and we ought to blame them, but who raised them? It was the previous generation. And who raised that generation? The previous generation. And I think, generally speaking, everyone acknowledges our world is getting worse and worse. Okay? But it's always the previous generation's responsibility, because they're the ones that raised that new generation. And I find it funny when I hear parents say, oh, you know, kids, like they complain about their kids. It's like, oh, you know, kids these days. Hey, they're your kids. You're the one that raised them like that. Like, it's not just kids these days. They're your kids. They're your responsibility. And that is what I'm finding in our world today. A lack of responsibility, a lack of uh, respect of authority, and just not respecting the institutions that God has ordained in our lives. Okay? So, first thing that I want to bring out to your attention is that everybody, everybody is accountable to God. All of us must give an account to God one day. I'll just quickly read to you from Romans 14, 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Everybody, when we pass on into this life, will stand before the judgment of God and give an account for what we've done in this life. Okay? Now, uh, last week, was last week that I preached in hell? Was it last week? I think it was. So the unbeliever would basically give an account for the works that they've done. And as you already know, their names are not going to be found in the book of life. And they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. But even as a believer, we are going to give an account for the works that we've done. We're not going to give an account for our sins. Our sins have been paid for by Jesus Christ. But for the works that we've done for, for Jesus Christ, for the things that are eternal in nature, you know, God's going to come and judge those things on the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? Even Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, He said, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account in the day of judgment. You know, the, even the words, the idle words, the nonsensical words that are spoken of, we're all going to give an account for that. Okay? And even you say, well, what kind of words are we going to give an account?
account for. I'll tell you the words I'm going to give an account for. Uh, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right? So if the Lord asks me, hey, you know, give an account of what you spoke, I'll say, well, I've called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to save me. And I'm glad to give an account of those words. And again, we're not going to give necessarily because we're saved. We're not going to give an account of our sinful words. But the non-believing world, yes, even their idle words, they have to give an account to God for those things. Now, the point I want to bring to your attention is that while we're all going to give an account for ourselves, God has also given us institutions, organizations. And those that are in our authority, those that are the head of those organizations, will give an account of those institutions themselves. What am I talking about? Yes, government. We spoke about government. Uh, but also your family. Your family is an institution that God has given you. You know, your workplace, the business that you work from, that's another institution. And the New, uh, the new Testament church. The church is another God-ordained institution that is given us. Okay? Now, if you're someone that, you know, if you're just a regular human being born into, a world, into the world, you already are part of two institutions as soon as you're born. Okay? You're part of the family unit. Doesn't matter how messed up your family is, it doesn't matter how broken that home is, that is still a family institution that God has put you in. And of course, if you're born into a nation, usually you're registered and now you're an official citizen of that government, part of that, you know, that, that nation. Okay? So you immediately start, as soon as you're born into this world, under two institutions that God has ordained. Okay? And within every institution, there is that authority structure, right? There's the leaders. And then there are those that are subjected unto those leaders. That's how institutions work. That's how things remain orderly. That someone calls the shots and there are other people that carry out that work. That carry out that vision of the leaders. Okay? Now, uh, some people don't like this. They don't like thinking that there is someone above them. Okay? Children, when they want to disobey their parents, they don't like the fact that mom and dad call the shots and they need to obey their parents. Okay? And so there are some people that hate government so much, they try their best to be completely off the radar, you know, try, and try to live without you know, having to submit themselves to any kind of government authority. Okay? There's all of that. But you know what? As much as you want to get away from those structures, God is the one that has instituted those organizations. Okay? It's God. They're the powers of God we read about. They're powers of God. All right? And the reason why this needs to come into place is because God Himself operates with an authority structure. You know, I preached not, to, not too long ago on the Trinity. Okay, and what did we learn about the Trinity? That God the Father has the highest authority in the structure within the Trinity. Right? God the Father, who sent out the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and then you have the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father sending the Holy Ghost uh, to teach us all the things that Christ has taught us. Okay? We say, even within God Himself, there is order. And there is an authority structure. Okay? And so if that's how God is, then you would expect His creation, the way He has established humanity, that it would also have a breakdown of a, like a chain of command, like an authority structure within different institutions. This is how God keeps things orderly. Now I'm just going to quickly turn from, to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 40. I didn't have this in my notes. I just wrote it down before... Just before we started the church service today, uh, 1 Corinthians 14.40. And I just want to show you, 1 Corinthians 14.40, the Bible reads, and this is in the context of the church. Okay, if you read about this, it's about how a church ought to run. But then at the end of that, it says, let all things be done, be done decently and in order. Okay, decently and in order. The reason why God has established institutions is so things will be done decently and in order. Okay, there will be an orderly uh, way of doing things. Because when you don't have these institutions, things get out of order. Things get out of control. Okay, when you don't have this authority structure, things get out of control. We're going to have a look at that shortly. Okay, now, first thing I want to talk about is the family institution. The family institution. All of us uh, are from a family. And I'll get you guys to turn to Ephesians 5. If you can turn there, turn to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. The point I want to make, guys, is that every institution has a leader or has a head. 
Okay? Every institution has a leader or has a head. And within the Godhead himself, we said that was God the Father. Within the family, most of you guys know the answer to this, I hope. Who's the head of the family? We're going to look at this in Ephesians 5.23. Uh, pay attention, wives, because this is, I'm sure, a favorite verse for many wives. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife. <laughs> All right? Even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Hey, wives, you've got a head that's over you. You have somebody who's in authority over you. And the Bible says that is the husband. All right, and the, the husbands can say amen if you want to that. Okay? You, the husbands, are the head of your wife. Okay? And if you look at verse 22, just look at the verse before that, Ephesians 5.22. Ephesians 5.22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So the wife is to be in subjection or submissive to her husband because her husband has the high authority. Just like the Lord has a higher authority over everybody. In the same way that we submit, wives are to be submissive to, the, to, the, to her husband. Okay. Now go to Ephesians chapter 6. Just go uh, look at the next chapter. Look at verse number 1. Ephesians 6 verse 1. The Bible reads, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Children, for the kids that are here, it says, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So who are the parents? Mum and dad. Mum and dad, you guys have an authority over your children. Yes, you know, dads, you've, you're the head of your house. But uh, mothers, wives, you also have authority in your home. And that is over your children. Okay? Your children are not the ones that call the shots. You don't run your household around the children. Okay? It's your children that ought to uh, learn how to exist within this framework. Within obeying mum and dad. And this is how uh, these institutions operate. Okay? This is how these institutions operate. There is a leader, there is a head, and then there are those that are subject to that leader, to that head. Okay? That's the family unit. Now let's look at government. Please turn to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, verse 11. Genesis chapter 4, verse 11. Genesis chapter 4, verse 11. Because I want to show you how without institutions, how things become a disaster. Okay, because the Bible says we need to have things that are done orderly. Okay, and we'll see how things become disorderly when you don't have these proper institutions in place. Genesis chapter 4 verse 11. Now this picks up the story, and we're not going to go through it all. Obviously you know about um, Cain and Abel. And obviously you know the story of Cain killing his brother Abel. Okay, let's pick it up here from verse number 11. This is the punishment that God gives Cain. He says in verse 11, And now art thou cursed from the earth which have opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall thou be in the earth. So if you remember, a Cain was a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer. He could produce uh, vegetation, fruits and veggies. And that's what got him in trouble with the Lord because he brought that. He brought the works of his hands as a sacrifice to God. And God is saying, hey, part of your curse, Cain, is that if you work the ground, it's not going to give it strength. It's not going to produce for you. And that's why it's going to be like a, a vagabond, a fugitive. He's going, go, like going around begging for, for his needs. All right. Verse 13. And Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. That's what Cain said. But let's pause there for a minute. Cain says, hey, this is a, 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 a great punishment. It's, it's greater than what I can bear. But what is the punishment? What is the biblical punishment for a murderer? Who wants to answer that? Anyone? The biblical punishment for a murderer? Put to death. Put to death. Put to death. So we read about that later on in the law of Moses, that a murderer, in fact, even before that, we'll have a look at that, that a murderer is to be put to death, okay? And, and so it's, it's interesting because Cain says, look, I mean, Cain's not even being put to death, all right? But he's saying, look, the punishment is greater than what he can bear, okay? Verse 14. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. You know, Cain says, look, anyone that finds me, because remember, it's just, it's, 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 it's only the family that was there, Adam and Eve's family. So if other brothers or sisters or my nephews and nieces, whatever, if they want to take revenge and they find me, they'll kill me, okay? They'll kill me for killing, you know, Uncle Label or whatever, you know? Verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. 
And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any find in him should kill him. So God says, look, if anyone kills you, Cain, I'm setting a mark on you. If anyone kills you, they're going to have a punishment sevenfold worse than what I punished you with. So you see, God did not put here the death penalty. And you say, well, why is that? Well, there was no government put in place just yet. There was no government put in place on the earth at this point in time. Now go to verse 23 of the same chapter, Genesis 4, 23. That was the first murder that we read about. The second murder that we read about in the Bible is in verse 23. Let's have a look at this. Uh, this is about Lamech, this man Lamech. By the way, Lamech had two wives, which was wrong, uh, but he had a very successful children. They were very successful in the land. We won't go into all of that right now, but it seems like they were doing very well. They were prospering financially, all kinds of things. Uh, verse 23, And Lamech said unto his wives, uh, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. So what's he done? He's slain a man, he's murdered someone, okay? This uh, Lamech. Then look, look what he says in verse 24. He says, If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. Uh, so you see that uh, Lamech says, well, look, if, if God was protecting Cain uh, from revenge and the punishment would be sevenfold, well, if someone kills me in revenge for murdering someone, then God, like he's putting upon himself, God will avenge me, you know, seventy and sevenfold. Okay? Seventy and seven, seventy-sevenfold. Okay? So I don't really know why he thinks this. I, I think potentially because he was a prosperous and successful man because he had uh, children who were successful uh, I think one was um, like a, a silversmith or something uh, like doing what do you call them the people that do tools smiths uh, he was one of those kinds of people and so he probably saw himself of a higher value than what Cain saw himself okay he probably saw himself as, as a higher position in society and he thought well if, if someone kills Cain they punish sevenfold then truly me is 70 and sevenfold so you can see this downward spiral you can see that people I'm thinking they can get away with murder. They can just murder someone, but God will protect me. If someone kills me, then there's a greater curse than what came before me. And so you can see if, if, if uh, murder is not being punished, you can see how bad the world would get over time. Okay? Especially when they're hearing about the, the fact that murderers are not being punished except for a curse, they're not being put to death. Now go to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. And what we see here is that the earth truly did become more violent. It became a lot more violent. Genesis 6, 11, it says, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So you can already see before that, right? People getting away from murder, they think they can just kill someone, and they'll be fine. And look at verse 12. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So I just want to show you what happens to the earth when there's no government institution, when murderers are not being put to death, okay? What happens? The world becomes exceedingly wicked, okay? Exceedingly wicked. And this is the point where God decides to just destroy the whole world, right? He sends the flood. Obviously, you know the story of Noah. Only Noah and his family survived the flood. God destroyed, just wipes out humanity because he had gotten so wicked, okay? There was no government in place. You need to understand that. Okay, now go to, go to Genesis chapter 9, Genesis chapter 9, verse 5. Genesis chapter 9, verse 5. Genesis chapter 9. So after the flood, after Noah and his family get off the ark, uh, God establishes something new. Okay, uh, Genesis 9, 5. Genesis 9, 5. This is some instructions that God gives Noah. He says, And surely, so this is shortly after they came off the ark. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man. And at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Look at verse 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So what do we see? God puts a new rule in place. They've come off the ark. He says, if anyone murders somebody, then they're going to uh, be slain. They're going to be put to death. <laughs> this is the first time we see God institute the death penalty. 
Okay, and this is basically government. This is God putting government in place so there would be some civil order. There'd be some punishment uh, for the wicked doers. Okay, and uh, some people call this this you know the first government that gets put in place. But it's a very clear instruction that God gives to Noah, and obviously Noah then carries this out and teaches his children and grandchildren. And then eventually we see you know uh, the story of Babel. We won't go to all of that, but we see uh, mankind abusing government there as well. But anyway, we won't go to that right now. Um, if I'm just going to read to you, you guys can stay there. Yeah, you guys can stay there, and um, I'll go. I'll, I'll just. Are you in Romans 13? If you're in Romans 13, you can go back. But if not, that's fine. Romans 13 verse three. We're talking about government. There it says, uh, "For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil." So government, guys, is supposed to be a terror to those that do evil works, to those that are wicked. Okay, not to do those, um, it's, it's not to be a terror to those that do right. Okay, and some people with the death penalty, some people think, well, that was Old Testament teaching. You know, the, the reason. And look again, think about our society. Why is things? Why are things getting worse? Why are become people becoming more wicked? Why is violence increasing in this world? You know, what what did we see in Genesis when the death penalty is not being carried out? It becomes a lot more wicked. People are getting away with it. What's happened to our society? The death penalty is gone. Right? It, it doesn't like... The, the Bible gives us a list of crimes that's punishable by death. Okay? And people resist this. They just don't like it. They, they, I've had people say to me, Oh, you don't believe people need to get saved. You don't believe people need the gospel because you believe in the death penalty. That's ridiculous. Right? I mean, if people were being lined up to be put to death for certain crimes, I think that's a great opportunity to give them the gospel. Right? Because this is their last chance. Hopefully they get saved. Hey, but they still need to pay on this earth for the crimes they've committed. Okay? And we say, oh, that's just Old Testament teaching. Hey, I'm reading you from, the, from Romans. I'm reading from, from the book of Romans well into the New Testament time. Okay? Romans 3. And I just read it to you. Uh, but to the evil, it says, Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. And then look what it says about government. It says, For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. Look what it says about government. The government does not bear the sword in vain. You say, what is a sword? Hey, the sword is a weapon of warfare. The sword is a weapon to kill. Okay? The sword is a weapon to behead. All right, this, is the new, this is the New Testament. The, the, the Bible is telling us that government has a responsibility to bear that sword. Okay, if someone does a crime punishable by death, then they ought to be afraid that government will come down with a sword. Okay? And then it says, For he, the government, is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So is government meant to terror those that do good works? That are just your model citizens? Of course not. But do we live in, uh, you know, do we live with governments that are corrupted? You know, with fallen men that hate God? Absolutely. Okay? I truly believe government, you know, we're talking about the Australian government, is just way too big. That government has their hands in too many places in our lives. I mean, they've got, your, they've got their hands, uh, you know, in your work. In your business, they've got their hands all over your family. They're trying to tell you what you need to do with your children. Hey, we have, look, that's not the role of government. The Bible tells us that the role of government is to punish evildoers and to put people to death that are deserving of death. Another responsibility of government is, I, I guess, a defense force to protect the nation, okay, uh, from people that would seek to attack or hurt the nation. These are the main responsibilities of the government. It's not their responsibility to educate your kids, to raise your kids. It's not their responsibility to give you, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go through this all later on, okay? But there is a proper place for government. And when they start overstepping their boundaries, when they start reaching out outside of their authority that God has given them, that's when we get corrupt government. That's when we get corrupt government. But is government in of itself bad? No, okay? There's a purpose for it. It's a minister of God. It's got a purpose, all right? Now, uh, if you can go to Colossians chapter 3. Go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I want to talk about the institution of business. 
the institution of business. So most people that go to work, you, you go to a place of work and, and you work hard and that's your place of business, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. God wants, you know, especially fathers, you know, men, this is our responsibility to go out and earn the dollar to make sure that there's food on the table, to make sure that our family is protected and provided for. This is good and right. While you turn there, I'm just going to read to you from Genesis 2.15. Uh, this is after God creates Adam in Genesis 2.15. It says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. Hey, day number one, Adam's created, right? He's given the beautiful garden and God says, I'm putting you to work, Adam. All right? It's your job to dress and keep the garden. You know, Adam was employed, if you want to put it that way, by God himself. You know, man, this is, this is a responsibility of men. Look, even before Adam had a wife, God said, Adam, go to work, right? Start making a living for yourself. And eventually, you know, God gives me the wife. But this is, this is the proper uh, responsibility and ownership of men. It's our job, men, to go to work and provide for our families. Even Adam, okay? Even Adam, before he had fallen, was working, okay? This is, work is not a sinful thing. It's not an evil thing or wicked thing. It's something man was created to do. Man was created to go to work. And I don't know about you, I don't work a full-time job anymore. But when I used to work a full-time job, and I'd come home and I'd see my kids fed, looked after, clothed, Every day, and everyone's you know happy and looked after. It, it gave me great satisfaction. I was like, awesome! You know, I've done. You know, I'm providing for my family. It gave me great satisfaction as a man. Okay, this is just something that is inbuilt in the nature of man. But go to Colossians three twenty two. Colossians three twenty two. Because I want to show you uh, now the institution of a business. How God has instituted a business, how there's authority in a business, there's the employer and there's the employees. Look at Colossians 3.22. It says, servants, these are the employees, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. So what's our responsibility as employees? To uh, obey our masters, to um, um, obey the employers. Or if you have a supervisor... You know, manager, whatever you have above you, that's the person you need to obey. It says, not with eye service, as men pleasers. Don't do things just when they're watching. Don't do things when, you know, uh, just to please them. All right? D work hard in singleness of heart, fearing God. Okay? Look at verse 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartedly as to the Lord and not unto men. Now, this is, look, for anyone that hates their jobs or doesn't like their managers or employers, this is the best verse to memorize and just meditate on during the day. All right? I've, I've worked with some difficult people. And I'm not talking about you guys. <laughs> but, well, maybe a little. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but look, this is what's going to get you through, okay? It says, Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Hey, whatever place you work in, just come to realize this is where God has put me. This is where God wants me, and I'm going to work hard as though God is my employer. Okay, not as to men. Okay, I'm going to work as if Jesus Christ himself is my employer. Look at verse 24. Knowing that of the Lord, ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. What's that talking about? Listen, when you go to work, it's not just, I'm saying as a believer, okay? It's not just a paycheck you're taking home. It's not just your paycheck. If you set your heart that you're serving Jesus Christ, God says you're going to receive, you're going to receive the reward from Him. Okay, The reward of the inheritance. Now, I don't know where the passage is right now, but God tells us, hey, if, if you serve Him, that you're going to be rewarded 100-fold in the life to come, in, in eternity. You know, a lot of people think, oh man, I've got to be a pastor, I've got to be a missionary, I've got to go and be full-time service for God to get all the rewards. No, you can earn rewards in your secular job as long as in your heart you have set that I'm, I'm serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you're not just taking a paycheck home, but you're also receiving the reward of God who's laying up treasures for you in heaven. 100-fold. Okay? I, I don't know about you, when I used to work public holidays, you get maybe double time or triple time, whatever. You know, that's nice. What about a hundred time? Okay, what about a hundred time uh, pay? Okay, by Jesus Christ in heaven for all eternity. Okay, so we see uh, that employees, there's an authority structure. Okay, employees are to do what the employers have asked them to do. And you might say, well, what if my employer asks me to do something that's, that's going to hurt the business? Well, I think you should let them know, hey, this might not be a good option. 
But if, at the end of the day, it's their call. Okay? If they want to do it, just do it. And if it hurts the business, hey, at least you warned them. Okay? But at least be obedient. Don't, 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 uh, don't be disobedient. Because this is, the, this is the authority structure that God has given us. I'm talking about the family. I'm talking about the government. I'm talking about the business. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter two. First Peter chapter two verse eighteen. First Peter chapter two verse eighteen. It says servants. So put it in, in our world, our, our speaking. You know, if you want uh, employees, you know, be subject to your masters with all fear, and not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. Does anyone know what that word froward means? Froward. It means like a difficult person. Okay, a difficult, hard to get along with person. So let's read that again. Servants be subject to masters of all fear, not only to the good and gentle. Hey, have you ever worked for an, uh, a manager or someone that was good and gentle to you? You probably liked working for them. You probably liked to serve them, right? You're probably like, hey, yeah, this is, I'm glad to come to work. And look, it's a good thing to work for someone that wants to work alongside you and encourage you and get you motivated and all those kind of things, but also to the forward. Okay, if you have a difficult manager, you have a difficult employer, it makes your life more difficult, they don't, just, they don't seem to listen to what you have to say, it's still said, be subject to your masters with all fear. This is the proper and good way to do things, guys. And if, look, if it's that bad, just get out of there and find another job. Okay? Instead of trying to upset the apple cart and destroy things. You know, but look, these are the institutions God has given us. There's an authority structure, an authority structure. Someone that calls the shots, and people that follow, people that obey, people that do those things, okay? Now, the reason I said this is very important, uh, because, as I said, our, our, our generation, guys, just has no, uh, um, has no respect for authority, in general, just no respect. You can ask someone to do that, so do something, and, you know, they'll fight you over it or whatever, they, they won't listen, you know, kids, you know, don't listen to their parents these days, you know, that, you know people just don't, don't care about the government, what God has interested in government. Now, we need to be responsible, and we need to be responsible as, as uh, people that are subjected under authority, but also those that are in authority also have a, even have a greater responsibility, a greater accountability. Because as I said, you're not just giving an account for your own life, but those that are in power have to give an account for their institution that God has given them. Okay? As I said, fathers, you need to give an account for your family. All right? If your family, if your kids are messed up, if your kids are seeking the world and, and don't want anything to do with God, you can't turn around and blame your wife and blame the kids. All right? Adam tried that. Remember when God came to Adam uh, in the Garden of Eden? He goes, oh, it was, it was a woman you gave me. It was, it was her fault. And Eve was like, no, no, no it was the devil. Right? It, it, that's, just, that's, how, that's how mankind is. We, instead of taking responsibility, we like to blame other people. All right? And you might say, well, it's awesome. It, it, I can't wait to have the authority. I want to be the one that calls the shots. Instead of, and I want to have people under me. That's fine. That's good. But hey, and, 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 uh, and, and uh, you know, rejoice and enjoy when things go well. But when things go bad, don't blame those that are under you. As a leader, you need to take responsibility of your own actions. You need to put your hand up and say, yeah, I was in error. I was wrong. You now try to fix things instead of blaming other people. Okay, so we need a, a society, and as God's people, we need to be people that take accountability, that take responsibility for what God has given us. Okay, now go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. We're moving on to another institution, and it's the institution of the church. The institution of the church. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Hebrews 13, verse 17. The Bible reads, Obey them, and this is the context of the church. I'll, I'll prove that to you in a minute. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give accounts. Do you see that? that? There's that account again. That they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Okay, so it, this is basically the church pastor, the church bishop, whatever name, elder, whatever name you want to use. The Bible says that they have a rule of you. You know, in this church, within this congregation, I have the authority in this congregation. I have the rule of you. 
Okay, I don't have that authority. That's the authority that God has given me. Okay, now again, understand this is within the church. You know, when we're gathered for church, when we're having church service, I'm the one that calls the shots. I'm the one that decides oh, at the end of the day how church ought to be run. Okay, this is how things are done orderly. Hey, and if I ask something from you in the context of the church, hey, you should carry that out. You should be submissive to that. Okay, hey, but when you leave church, when you go home, I no longer have authority over you in that area. Okay, or if you're in a workplace, you need, you need to obey, you know, your, your manager, or whatever. Hey, but when you go home, your manager has no authority in your home. Who has the authority in your home? Dad, husband. You know, that's the person that has the authority in the home. Okay? And so God has given us proper institutions in place to keep things orderly. Okay? Now I'm going to quickly read to you. Um, you got, actually, actually, before, actually move, before I move on, it said uh, uh, they may do it with joy. So give that account. So did you know that pastors have to give an account for you? How you were in the church, how you served in the church. Alright? So you want to be mindful because if you're someone that's trying to uh, cause division, you're, you're someone that's trying to cause problems in the church, the pastor has to give an account for you. Alright? And then it says that they may do it with joy and not with grief. But that is unprofitable for you. What does this tell me? It tells me that if the pastor, the bishop, gives a good account of you as someone that was in the church, that means it's profitable for you. Okay? That means when we stand before God and I start going through your names, I don't know exactly at what point this is, you know, it's going to be profitable for you that I give you a good account for you being a faithful servant in the church. Now, I guess God's going to lay up some more treasures for you. All right? Add another golden brick to your mansion or whatever. Whatever those treasures are. Okay? It's profitable. But if I give you a bad account, uh, you know, brother so and so, sister so and so, they, they, were, they were problem, they were troublemakers, that's not profitable for you. You're not going to gain anything out of that. Okay? So be mindful, whether it's this church or whether in the future you find yourself in another church, hey, be, be subject to the pastor, be subject to the person in authority, because that will make it profitable for you, okay? And uh, if you guys go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, and while you're turning there, I'm going to, take, I'm going to read from 1 Timothy chapter 5. You guys go to 1 Peter 5, and I'll read to you from 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. 1 Timothy 5, 17. The Bible reads, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. That means they should be paid. Well, I'm not being paid. Don't worry about it. That's not, that's not, that's not the topic for tonight. All right? Uh, be worthy of double honor, especially, especially those who labor in, the, in word and doctrine. Okay, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. It says, let the elders that rule well. Okay, so we, there's that word again, the rule and the elders. And that word elders, as you'll see in the Bible, is interchangeable with the word bishop or pastor or, or, or these things. Okay, but notice that it's the responsibility of the pastors to labor in, the, in word and doctrine. Okay, so when we meet here weekly, you know, I, I need to make sure that I'm feeding you the Word of God, that I'm feeding you doctrine. Otherwise, I'm not worthy of that double honor. Okay, otherwise, I'm not worthy of that double honor. I just want to show you that same word being used there, the rule. Okay, there's, there's authority in church. Now, you guys are in 1 Peter 5, look at verse 1. 1 Peter 5, verse 1. It says, The elders, is that word again, and the elders, as we saw before, were someone that rules the church, which are among you, I exhort. Who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. So these are the writings of Peter. And he says himself he's an elder. He was a pastor. He was a church pastor in Jerusalem. Okay. And then he says, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Look at verse 2. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Taking the oversight thereof. Not by constraints but willingly. Not for filthy lucre but of a ready mind. So what are pastors to feed the church? What's the responsibility of the pastor that has a rule of the church? To feed the church, right? And we have some melons here. And um, did anyone else bring any food? We've got some food over there. No, that's, that's, not the, that's not what I'm meant to be feeding you with, okay? I'm feeding you the Word of God. That's, that's the point. The uh, Word and doctrine as we saw in 1 Timothy 5. But look at verse 3. Neither as lords over God's heritage, but being an ensample to the flock. So notice that, notice that. Does the elder have authority and rule in the church? Yes, 
Should the church members be obedient to the pastor in context of that church? Yes. Okay, these things are right and good. But verse number three, to warning to pastors, neither has been lords over God's heritage. The Bible calls you his heritage, his inheritance. Okay, so a pastor is not to be a lord over you. Okay, like I said, I have the authority in this church. I don't. I'm not your lord anywhere else. Okay, I don't go to your house and tell you what to do. I don't tell you how to live your life. Look, I I, pre- I preach from the word of God. My hope and desire is, especially the fathers, because you're the head of your home, that you will take what you heard and apply it to your family. But it's not my job to go into your house and demand you do these things. This is, you know, your responsibility to either take it on board for yourselves or for your families. It's not the pastor's responsibility to overstep their boundaries. Like we spoke about governments that overstep their boundaries. Hey, no, uh, uh, pastors, elders are not to step over their boundary. Their authority is in the church and not lords over the, over the people. Okay, not lords of the people, not telling them what to do. And this is very important because I have seen pastors... And even pastors in the independent fundamental Baptist movement being lords of the people, okay? And um, it's, it's very, um, it happens a lot in the Philippines, guys. I've, I've seen this happen in the Philippines. In some of these other nations where maybe it's not, it's not so much like a, fir- a first world nation, um, I've, I've often seen pastors have uh, been seen like these, I don't know, like these uh, men that are, that are more holy or something, more... Uh, I, I don't know, like almost worshipped, okay? And I have, I have heard stories, and I've seen it myself in my own eyes, where people would come to the pastor and basically ask the pastor to run their lives, all right? Pastor, what kind of work should I get? You know, what, what kind of woman? You know, should I marry this girl or should I marry that girl? Or even, I've seen people come and say, is it okay if I go on holidays? Is it, look, I'm planning on going on holidays, October, you know, let's say October, blah, blah, blah. Uh, is it okay if I go on holidays during this time? It's like, what in the world? Right? What in the world? Now, if you go on holidays, I'd like to know, because then I know you won't be in church during that time. But, hey, it's not my decision to, to you know, decide how you ought to uh, do things in your life. Okay? And uh, I've seen this, and I've seen this over and over again, in, especially in certain nations that uphold their pastors like that Lord over their, their heritage. And then when things don't go well, when things don't go according to plan, instead of taking responsibility for their own action, what happens? Oh, the pastor told me to do it. That was Pastor so and so. Pastor so Look, Pastor so and so should never have told you anyway. You need to take responsibility for your own actions. Yes, it's their job to preach in the church, but it's not their job to run your life. Okay? And I'm going to make a point of this soon. Okay? Look at verse number four. Look at verse number four. Oh, by the way, uh, verse number three, it ended but with, but being an ensample to the flock. So instead of being a lord and demanding you to live a certain life, you know, the past is, it should be set in an example, an example. Okay, that, that's, that's, and then people ought to really uh, not just learn from the word of God, but also learn from the example that that pastor is giving. Okay, uh, that's, how, that's how you should influence people. Not by demanding them to do a certain thing or threatening them or, or, or things like that. Look at verse 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear. Who's the chief shepherd? Jesus Christ. Ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So obviously, I want that crown of glory. That's a special crown for pastors. You know, if I, if, I, if I run things well, then God's going to give me that crown of glory that doesn't fade away. But if I'm a poor pastor, I'm not going to get that crown of glory. Okay? Now look at verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace uh, to the humble. So it says, submit unto the elder. Again, you've got to understand the context here. It's not just talking about an older person. It's actually talking about that church pastor, the one that has the rule over you. Okay? So you see that authority. We see that leadership. We see that submission to that leadership in that institution. It's within the context. Okay? Now, um, go to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, verse 1. Colossians chapter 4, verse 1. Colossians chapter 4, verse 1. So uh, this is talking about business, okay? Going back to the topic of business, but just to, to get a, a, an application out of this. Colossians 4, verse 1. I really spoke to you guys that um, 
if you're the head of an institution, you need to give an account not just for your life, but an account for that institution. Look at, look at Colossians 4.1. It says, Masters, again, if you want to put employers there, you can put that. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal. Okay, now let's stop there for a minute. So it says, look, employers, you know, your servants, your employees, give unto them that what is just and equal. Okay, if they've worked hard, if they've earned their salary, whatever, their bonuses, whatever agreement has been put into place, if, they, if they've earned that, then give them what is just and equal. Okay, don't try to cheat your employees out of benefits or cheat your employees out of things, make them do things that was never agreed upon. Hey, treat them right, treat them just, treat them equally. But look at the second part. Why? Why is this so important? Knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Okay, who's the master in heaven? Jesus Christ. Hey, who's really the head of that business? Is it the employer? No, it's actually Jesus Christ. In fact, what you'll see with all these institutions that God has ordained, yes, God has put a man in place to be the head of that, but above that institution is always the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you know, above Jesus Christ is God the Father. And so Jesus Christ watches what we do in these institutions that he's given us to, to manage and to maintain. Hey, he watches the masters because he himself is a master in heaven. Okay? So be mindful of that if you're an employee, employer. Hey, you know, make sure you understand that Jesus Christ is watching you because there's going to come a time where you need to give an account for how you run that institution that God has given you. Okay? Now I'm going to read to you from James 3.1. James 3.1. It says, My brethren... Be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Wow. Okay. It says, look, this is a warning. Hey, don't try to be the master of everything. All right. Now, if you want to use this language of master, I am the master of my family. Right. God has put me as the head of my house. You know, the church I've got in Caloundra. I'm, in a sense, the ruler there. I've got the authority and in this church as well. All right. Now, I don't want any more masterships. All right? I don't want to be running multiple organizations and multiple institutions. And I don't want to be in government either and have that responsibility upon me. Because the instruction or the warning is, don't be our many masters. Okay? Because God wants masters to operate his institution well. And look after the servants. Look after those that are submissive to whatever institution that is. And then it says, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. So who does God hold accountable? Who does God come down stronger in judgment? The, 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 one, the, the one that's in leadership or the one that are following him? The one that's in leadership. The master. You know, you've got a greater accountability. All right? It's a wonderful thing to be a father, to be a husband, to be married and have children. It's a wonderful thing. Hey, but there's great responsibility. There's great responsibility. God holds you accountable for the whole family. Okay, and if you're in government, you're the prime minister or whatever, there's a greater responsibility. You've got so many people under you, you're running the entire nation, okay, and those prime ministers, whoever's in leader, you know, they're going to be held to greater accountability and condemnation before God if they don't do things right, all right? In any institution, this is true, okay? And I'll just read to you quickly from Proverbs 27, Proverbs 27, verse 23. It says, Be thou diligent. To know the state of thy flocks. So it's written as though you have, you're like a, a farmer, you have sheep and you have flocks. And it says, look, be diligent. You know, work hard, be studious. Know the state of your flocks and look well to thy herds. Okay? God says, look, whatever I've given you, whatever is under you, look after it. Know the state of your flocks. You know, as fathers, head of your homes, know the state of your wife. Know the state of your children. How are they doing? How are they growing? Are they, are they maturing spiritually? Are they growing in love for the Lord? Know them. You know? Don't be the father that just goes to work and then you know, the kids never know that they're, they're, they're father. They disappear. They're, they're somewhere else. They're not there. They're not involved in the family. And the kids grow up. They don't even know that. Don't be that. Okay? You need to know the state of your flocks. Otherwise, your, your institution is going to crumble and, and break away. Okay, uh, employee, employers, you need to know the state of your employees. All right, it's not just about getting the work done, but knowing the state of your employees, knowing how they're doing. Are they, you know, uh, uh, do they need help? Do they need more resources to do the job? Whatever, whatever you've given them to do. Hey, know the state of your flocks. You know, uh, the government. You know, the prime minister. Those that put uh, laws into place. They need to know the state of the nation. 
Okay? And that, you know, they ought to know that things are getting uh, worse. They ought to know no matter what laws they seem to put into place, why are things getting worse? Why is the crime rate getting worse? Why are there more broken homes than ever? Why is there more divorce than ever? Why, why is our, our, our society breaking apart? They keep bringing in these laws. They should stop and say, well, obviously what we're doing is not working. Maybe we need to go back to the Bible and see what God has taught us to do as government. That's what they should be doing. They ought to know the state of the nation. And myself as a pastor, I need to know the state of my flocks as well. You know, so I, I encourage you guys, if you have questions, if you have any, any difficulties, then share them with me so I can at least pray for you, you know, and maybe give you some godly counsel, maybe give you some godly advice, or maybe just put together a sermon next week and that will cover those kind of questions that you may have. And that's important, okay? Those that are in authority ought to be looking after the state of their flocks. I'm going to move on to one more bit here. Because there is a separation of institution. Okay, this is a very important topic. Um, and Baptists, in general, Baptists know... You, have you ever heard this, the phrase, uh, separation between church and state? Basically what they're saying is there ought to be a separation between government and the church. Okay? So government... It's not government... This happens, like, think about, you know, uh, the, the Dark Ages with the Catholic Church. Um, basically, the, government, the, the Catholic Church was the government as well. And so they were put to death those that would not line up with them uh, religiously, and things like that, okay? It, it's wrong for a government to force religion uh, on any, any kind of people, okay? That's wrong. There ought to be a separation between church and state. And it's, it's wrong for, you know, for... Let's say it's, it, it'd be wrong for the Australian government to tell me what to preach. It'd be wrong of them to tell me, hey, you can't preach on certain chapters. That's not their place. They, they can't stretch their hand out. They've got their institution. They've got their rule and authority. They've got it uh, organized and structured. It's not their hand to come to a church and tell us what to preach. Okay? But at the same time, it's not the church's role to take over the government and rule the nation. Okay? That's what we saw with the Catholic Church in those Middle Ages, or in the Dark, dark Ages, and all those kinds of things. Okay? So th there is a, a separation of institution. Okay? And um, what I want to say on that is that governments, guys, for, especially for fathers and men, for your family, government is not responsible for your family. Okay? Government is not responsible for your family. Who's responsible for the family? Dad, father, husband. You're responsible. You're accountable for your family. Okay? It's not the government's responsibility to make sure your family is looked after. Okay? It's not the government's responsibility to give handouts. You know, to, uh, to give money to, to uh, single mothers and to, to give... Look, and when, when, I, when I look at all this, we live in a welfare society. Okay, the reason we're taxed so heavily, okay, is because the government takes your money and gives it to someone else. Is essentially what's happening. Okay, that is wrong. That is theft. Okay, someone takes your money and gives, gives it to someone else. If I took your money right now, if I just took your wallet and, and, or, and gave it to someone else, that'd be theft, right? You, you didn't want that money going there and I just took it. That's what taxation basically is, okay? Now, is, do we see taxes and levies in the Bible? Yes. And we see that Jesus Christ taught that, you know, render unto Caesar, what, what belongs to Caesar, all those kinds of things, yes. But do we see anywhere where God commands a government to take money from somebody and give it to somebody else? No. So government in that situation has overstepped their responsibility, okay? And uh, so, and what I'm trying to say there is that what I see with a lot of broken families, and I, I think the reason why there are so many broken families is because it's not difficult to live in a broken home. It's not difficult to be a single mother. In fact, a single mother gets amazing amounts of money, okay? And, and the more children she has, the more money the government will give her. And, and, uh, and sometimes, you know, they'll give you a house. The housing commission will step in and give you a house. And they'll give you things, uh, uh, and you, you might have more than people that are working hard and trying to provide for their own family. Okay? And uh, again, the government's trying. They, they think they're trying to do a good thing. They're trying to help their people. But by taking money of others, they're making things more complicated. They're making it easier for young children to run away from home and live outside of the home uh, because they'll get handouts from the government. Hey, you, you, all they're doing is breaking the family structure that God has given us, okay? I mean, if it was difficult to be a single mum, you know, if it was difficult, there'd be a lot less single mums, right? There'd be a lot, the, the women in general would be trying to find a husband, a man, that would look after that woman for the rest of her life instead of making some stupid decision and having like a one-night stand or something, okay? So it's not government's responsibility to give you handouts, 
Now, do I receive handouts with 10 kids? I actually do. I get family, family tax benefit, okay? Now, my point is this. If you're, um, if you're eligible for some handouts, unfortunately, we operate in the system. Unfortunately, we operate in the system. Your taxes are being taken out, not just your, your, um, your salary that you get, but also what you pay for your groceries, what you pay for your day in, day out things. There are taxes upon that. You're being taxed nonstop. So look, you operate within the system. If you're eligible to some sort of handout, if you want to take it, then take it. But what I'm trying to say is this. Don't become reliant on the government. Don't start thinking it's the government's responsibility to look after me and my family. Hey, that's dad's job. Father, you need to go out, earn a paycheck, and if one job's not enough, then get a second job if that's what you need to do. That's the responsibility that God has given you, okay? It's also not the responsibility of the business, of the workplace, to look after your family, okay? It's not the responsibility of the workplace to look after your family. Now, uh, I'm not sure how many ladies work, you know, mothers work here, you know, but at the end of the day, God has given the responsibility of earning a paycheck to husbands. And God has given the responsibility of mothers to be at home, raising their children and educating their children, raising them for the Lord. That's the clear Bible teaching. That's the clear Bible teaching, okay? Uh, no apologies for that, okay? But what I find, because, and especially in Sydney, our house prices are so high, you almost can't afford, and I say almost, because somehow I was, I was able to do it, right? But generally speaking, it's very hard for people on a single income to buy a house these days, okay? And so usually, mum ends up having to go to work to pay for the mortgage, okay? But then what happens? What, what happens to the kids? Well, the kids then are taken to a public school system or they're being taken to some after-school care vacations, that they call them, okay, vacations or something, you know, or just, you know, little children being handed over to someone else that's not their mother to raise, okay? For what? For what purpose? To buy a house? To have more uh, possessions? To have more uh, material goods? You know? And so what happens is, and, and I, I experienced this myself in, in, in some of my previous work, because I, I used to employ a lot of people. And I had a lot of ladies that would work for me, okay? And sometimes those ladies would fall pregnant, as, as it's normal, right? They'd fall pregnant. And of course, when they, when they worked for the job, when they, when, they, when they took on the job, they had uh, maternity uh, pay, they had all these kind of benefits. That's fine. That, that's the agreement that the business had with that employee, employee that I've uh, got to carry that out. But then, after having the baby, let's say six months later or one year later, and still a little child, they want to come back to work and they'd say to me things like, oh, you know, I want to come back to work, but I can't work full time anymore. I can't have my old job. You know, can, you know I, I want to work maybe two days or three days a week. And these are the hours I need to work. And, and can you do this for me? And it's like, well, hold on. First of all, stop. Stop. First of all, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying this as an employer because I get in trouble. But I'm just thinking, what about your baby? You just had a baby. Like, why aren't you looking after that little child? Isn't that your responsibility? That's what I'm thinking inside of me. But then I'm also thinking, as someone that's, that's hiring people, it's like, well, hold on. You know the business runs from 9 to 5? You know there's work non-stop? For, uh, and this is why we need this many people. This is why we need this many people employed. This is the kind of work uh, production that we need to get out. We can't tailor the workplace in accordance to your life, to your children. Okay? First of all, mothers, you should be home raising your kids anyway. Okay? And secondly, I might not need you on those days, and I might not need you in those hours. I might need you other days and other hours, okay? And I would all, always look at the business needs first and say, okay, and then, you know, try to be a good employer, try to help them out, say, look, all right, I can do these days, I can do these hours for you, uh, but this, this is what the business needs from you. And you try to help them, and what happens? They get upset, they get angry. Oh, why doesn't this person look after me? You know, uh, why, why, you know, they get angry. You, you're trying to help them, they get angry. Why? Because they don't want to take responsibility for their own actions. They want to take responsibility for their own families. They want the business, which is a totally separate institution, to look after their family needs. That is wrong. That is wrong. The person that's in charge of that family is dad, is father. Okay? And those that are responsible for their children should be mom. Okay? So, you know, not only is our government not responsible for your family, business is not responsible for your family. Okay? And this brings me to my third point. This brings me to my third point. The church is not responsible for your family. 
okay? And the pastor is not responsible for your family. <laughs> and uh, I, I say this, uh, and I said to you when I started, this is a sermon that needs to be preached. And I, I truly believe it is, because people don't want to take um, responsibility for their own actions. And I think part of the reason why so many people are dependent on their pastors, okay, of their, just the questions of their life, is because they don't want to take responsibility when it doesn't work out, when it fails. When, when something fails and they took on the, 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 um, uh, you know, the thoughts or the, you know, the, the leadership of the pastor and it fails, then they point and say, well, it was pastor's fault. And they get angry at the pastor. Well, it's not the pastor's responsibility to look after your family anyway. Okay? It was dad's responsibility to take, respon to take ownership of that family. And I'm not saying, again, please don't, under don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you, know, you can't come to me with questions on, on, on your family, uh, seek some advice from Godly counsel, that's fine. Okay? But at the end of the day, it's your responsibility whether you're going to take my counsel or not take my counsel. It's your responsibility if you're going to take part of that counsel or not take part of any of that counsel. That's fine. Okay? It's, it's fine, but it's your responsibility. You're accountable to, for your own family. Okay? And the reason I say this, and I, and I say this um, with, with love to all of you, and um, is because before I became a pastor, before I, I, um, I had the desire to be a pastor for a long time, but one thing I noticed, a constant theme amongst pastors, and I don't know if it's just the people I came across, but I think uh, what, the people I came across is just an example of the greater picture. But I'm seeing pastors who are losing their kids, the pastor's kids are going into the world, they don't care about the Bible, they don't care about church, they're, they're living wickedly or whatever, I'm seeing pastors uh, commit adultery. I'm seeing pastors get divorced. You know, I'm seeing pastors' families crumble and fall apart. And I'm, I'm left wondering, why is this? Is this really what I want to do with my life? Right? I've risked my family falling apart. I love my family. I love my wife. I love my children. It would destroy me if I lost that. It would destroy me. And one of the qualifications of being a pastor is to have a faithful family. Okay, and we see uh, time and time again, again in the, in the, even in the Baptist circles, pastors' families just falling apart, and people are like, look at the pastors' kids, look how bad they are. Right, they ought to be serving as an example. Right, and uh, we're seeing that. And what I realized, this is what I finally realized, and it took me a while to get it all together. And um, I even sat down with one of my previous pastors, whose family was destroyed and he lost his ministry, and I sat down with him over coffee one day before I became a pastor, and I said, look. I need to know how did these cracks develop, what happened, what could it be done differently, because I don't want to make the same mistakes you made. All right? he, was, he was good enough to talk to me about things. Okay? But um, what I found out is that too many pastors are running around tr from house to house trying to fix everybody's problems, trying to fix everybody's families. They're going from family to family to family to family, trying to fix all their problems. Okay, spending hours and hours with you know men's wives, spending hours and hours with, with men or their children or whatever, all the time they're not spending time with their own family, not spending time with their own kids, not spending time with their own wives. They're trying to fix everybody's problems and their own house is falling apart. Dad's not there for them. Okay? And then I read my Bible and I say, well, hold on. If all these pastors are running around trying to fix everybody's problems, everyone's families, surely I'm gonna read this in the Bible somewhere. It's not there. You don't see that as part of the responsibility. In fact, we, we read through some of the responsibility. What is it? To labor in word and doctrine. To feed the church the word of God. That's the responsibility. Is it to go house to house and fix everyone's family? No. And so when pastors stop doing, stop doing the things that the Bible says, then naturally their families are going to fall apart. And I don't want that. Okay? And so I, this is why I believe this is an important message. Because I want you to wonder, first of all, look, I'm Billy here. I'm here, for, I'm here for like, not even a full day, and then I'm going back to... Uh, but I, I never wanted to have a church where there was this expectation that pastor was going to run around. Like, literally, I can call my pastor anytime, he's just going to run and leave everything to come and help me. Okay? Now, some pastors do that. Okay? And what, one thing that I noticed with all these pastors whose families fall apart, okay, who, uh, you know, when you ask the church congregation, what was your pastor like? What's the answer? Was he a bad pastor? No. They say he was an awesome pastor. You know, he was a great pastor. You know, anytime I needed him, he'd come to help me. Anytime there was a need, he'd be there. He was a great pastor. Yeah, he was so good, even better than the pastors you read about in the Bible, which is why then their families fell apart, because they weren't there for their own families. 
Okay, my point is this. You know, I want to take responsibility, I want to take accountability, I want to take authority for my own family because it's my family that even gives me the ability to have the office of a bishop because that's part of the qualifications, all right? And to make sure that I don't overstep my boundary. It's not my job to tell you how to live your life. It's my job to preach the Bible and then you decide how you want to live your life with what you heard. And it's my responsibility to be the head of my family, not to be the head of your family. Okay, and what I'm trying to say to you, fathers, especially fathers, there's a greater condemnation for the institution God has given you. You know, your responsibility, you're responsible for your own family. You know, if you want your wife to work, hey, that's on you. Okay, but you're going to hear preaching from me where it says that women ought not to work. Okay, but that's on you. That's on your family. That's on the head of your house. Okay, so that's what I wanted to talk about today. Guys, institutions are a good thing. Government in general, government, family, church, workplace, all good things. All things that God has given us to live orderly lives, to have things in order. That's how God is. Okay? And, you know, it's a good thing to be the head of these institutions. But understand you have a greater accountability from God. If things fall apart, it's your fault. You know, if a family falls apart, I'm going to blame the husband more than anyone else. Because they're the head of the house. They're the head of the family. Okay? So please, if you have uh, an institution that you're over, take it seriously. Do things as unto God. Understand that God is holding you accountable for the institution. Hey, if you're a servant to the institution, um, subject to a leader, hey, be obedient, be good, serve like you would serve the, the Lord, and, and make sure these institutions operate well, that they're good uh, for us, and that's what God has given us. And also, hey, understand what the church is. The church is here to learn the word of God. It's not for the pastor to rule your house. Okay, not to be lords over the heritage that God has given us. Okay, all right, let's pray.